Okay. So welcome everyone to our second virtual monthly meeting of the combined data governance and data vault enthusiasts here in the Treasure Valley. Looking forward to a presentation by Dan Robbins from Power Engineers on what they've been doing to uh, to thrive through the epidemic or pandemic. Um, uh, really only two announcements today. Um, the first one is that we don't have a confirmed speaker for next month yet. So please, uh, uh, for those of you with some sway in your organizations, please, um, you know, Vaughn told somebody to uh, to speak next week. Please, please feel free to reach out to me and and um, let me know. There were some suggestions, but I won't put anybody on the spot here. But uh, I would like to confirm here in the next week or so a, a topic for next month. Um, the next thing, uh, this is literally hot off the press. Eckerson is a research firm that they're out of Boston. We um, consult with them some here at Infovia, and they have a really talented team of research analysts. And this month, they published just actually about 30 minutes ago, they published their monthly newsletter, and it's on the topic of data governance and specifically automation in that space. So something to the effect of exactly what um, we're talking about today and have talked about in the past. So very, very appropriate for this um, for this group. I will send out the link to this research white paper if anyone is interested. Eckerson, you might remember, is the one uh, in December. Their newsletter said that 2020 was the year of the data vault. I, I think they didn't know about the pandemic at that point, but um, that said, um, they're the ones that made that prediction uh, back in January. So, that's going to go over to Dan. Dan Robbins from Power Engineers. Dan, can you take uh, take control? Go ahead and share your screen. I'll stop sharing mine, and um, you can kick it off from there. So I'll do a quick introduction. Dan and I go back, uh, I don't know, a couple decades maybe almost. Um, we've worked together at one organization, and Dan um, moved uh, to Power Engineers and then um, brought us in at Infovia a little bit last fall, I guess it was. We did a little work with them as they were starting up their data warehouse project. And um, they've taken it a long way since then and, and are getting value out of it. And so with that, um, with no further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Dan. There's also several others, Alan and um, I saw Bonnie and Keith join as well from over there at Power. So looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Take it away. I assume you can see my presentation, Mike. Loud and clear. Yep. All right. So basically, this is a presentation on how we leveraged BI uh, during the pandemic. So I know it's a little cheesy title, but uh, that's that's the best I can do, and it's pretty accurate. So as Mike said, I'm Dan Robbins, uh, application architect at Power Engineers. I've got 25 years of IT experience, so that just sounds horrible. It makes me sound old. Um, background web developer and UI design. So I guess I'm trying to say maybe I'm qualified to uh, help out on a project like we ended up creating here. And as you can see from the picture and my camera, uh, I'm usually wearing a, a hat, but I did dress up today and wear a collared shirt. So you, you guys are special. <laughs> so a little information about Power Engineer. So when I practiced this uh, to a, a group, I didn't have this slide in. And then as we kind of went through this, uh, some of the information later, it we kind of came back and said, hey, we, we need to explain who we are and what we're doing here. So uh, we're an engineering and consulting firm. Uh, we're headquartered in Haley, Idaho. We have 2,700 employees at 50 different locations. And we really make our profits by billing clients for design, consulting, project management, those types of things. So some of the key performance metrics we look at is utilization. So the percentage of billable hours someone is working versus their total hours worked. We also looked at a, look at a term called achieve multiplier. So this is really our return on investment for money spent on labor. 
And then we also look at backlog, which is really the projects we've won that are in the hopper, so to say. So how things are looking out, you know, six months, a year, those types of things. So the agenda for today's meeting, uh, I'm going to do a project overview, kind of introduce you to how we came to be working on the project, get into the project requirements, which were pretty minimal, as you'll see. Talk a little bit about a paradigm shift in how we did our development work. Talk about all the different data sources that we used, the architecture that we came up with. So again, that's pretty simple and, and Mike will be really familiar with that since he helped us uh, set that all up. We're just using pretty much that existing architecture. And then I'll talk about the final product, lessons learned, and that's it. So real quick on the overview, um, the, the whole COVID pandemic hit and our CEO and executive team approached us and said, they basically wanted a tool that would allow them to monitor the performance of our company, our industry, and the overall economy. Their ultimate goal was to utilize data visualizations to quickly identify trends. So I, I emphasize that now because as you go through some of the screenshots later and as I talk, trends are will keep coming up. So they didn't just want to look at a visualization or a, you know, a spreadsheet looking table with a bunch of numbers, they actually wanted to see visualizations with those trend lines, you know, whether that be month to month or year over year, those types of things. And they wanted it so they could be proactive and make data driven decisions. So the high level requirements, and as you see, you'll see this, this came on quick and we got to work on it quick. They basically came to us and said, we're going to need a lot of different data. We're going to need to be able to see trends, as I just mentioned. We need all the reports to be accessible from one location. So that really hits home for me because I'm like that. I like, you know, whether I'm writing an app or, you know, creating a website, I like lots of information in one spot. So that jived with me. And then we need the first version available within a week. So it, there's debate whether that was 10 days or, or seven, but anyway, it was quick. So once we started meeting with the executive team, uh, here are the pieces of data that they were interested in and the questions they wanted answered. So there's the executive team, and then here are the different pieces of data we started adding to the system. So. First off, they wanted the COVID data, so they wanted to know how the virus is affecting the country. And then, you know, of those 50 offices I talked about, are any in hotspots? So at the beginning, there absolutely was with, um, we have an office, Oradell in New Jersey. We have the Haley office. Those were among the leading office or areas in the nation when this virus first started. So they quickly were able to see that. They also wanted to see HR data, so they wanted to see how the pandemic was affecting us. Are we still able to recruit and hire? Is our turnover getting better or worse? We even gave them demographics so they could look into different age groups and, and were we able to retain at those different age groups, those types of things. Financial performance, I talked about that earlier. They wanted to know how we were doing financially. They wanted to watch our clients, so you know that's a being proactive, right? seeing how your clients are doing, and then how are our competitors doing? So if we have a competitor, say, in the generation business and they're doing really well, but another one's struggling you know, in the power delivery business, then maybe we need to shift, so shift strategies. So work from home, uh, another you know, key uh, piece of information that they wanted. So how is our network performing? You know, so we wanted to go out there and look at bandwidth. We wanted to look at how many users are logging in per day. Another stat they wanted to look at, look at is what is the percentage of workforce working from home? So in other words, are there enough people staying at home, keeping the offices, you know, safe and, and not a lot of people there or not? And so we provided that to them. And I, and I have a screenshot of, of this screen later on. So the economy, we 
they wanted to look at that. So how is the Dow Jones, S&P 500, those types of things doing? What are commodities like gold, steel, oil? What are they doing? And then just consumer information. So some of the finance people wanted to look at interest rates, unemployment, those types of things. Backlog. So I talked about how important backlog was to us. Uh, they wanted to see if we're still receiving proposals for new work that we can bid on. How does our backlog compare to last year? Are we still winning work? Those types of things. So to sustain the company in the future. And then AR and cash. So are we billing our clients in a timely manner? And then are they paying? So none of this really works if you're not receiving uh, you know, an influx of cash to keep the business going. So with all that, our goal was to, you know, give them that information and, and lead them down the yellow brick road. Okay, so we had a little bit of a paradigm shift, as I mentioned earlier. So we really had to adopt a agile development cycle. So if you're you know, delivering something within a week, you got to get functionality out there to get immediate feedback. So sometimes we were doing pro, uh, prototypes with just mock data, literally pictures of what it should, it, it might look like. And then that was in, intermingled with live data until it was approved by execs. Once someone approved it, you know, we'd switch it over to a, a, a real visualization out of Power BI. Sometimes we took a guess at what the execs might want to see. That worked out in, in some cases. I, I really can't think of anything we had to walk back that, that they didn't like. Obviously, things were optimized over time, but nothing that they were like, no, we don't like that, take it away. Another paradigm shift is our data polls become more frequent. So in our business, we look at a lot of things monthly, and that really switched to weekly. So back to that term proactive, they wanted to see some of these backlog trends and, and things like that quicker than normal so they could make proactive decisions. And I'll kind of explain later how that actually backfired in some cases. And then another paradigm shift is we weren't used to combining data from so many systems. That was new to us. And I actually list out all the different data sources on the next slide. So we were used to one or two different data sources, combining those into a data warehouse and reporting off that. But this was a new paradigm for us. And so here's all the different data sources that we looked at. So we have a system called Axiom that basically holds some financial data. We're pulling that weekly. Uh, it's basically a manual process to get that uploaded. We have another thing called direct access. So that's our network that I talked about. So be able to see the bandwidth, how many users are connecting. That's all automated. We're pulling that in hourly. Um, I won't go through all of these, but like our badge system, building access, we're pulling that in so we can see who's logging into what office, those types of things. We're getting the COVID data from John Hopkins and a little bit from Snowflake. They provide some demographic information on populations and stuff like that that you can subscribe to. Deltek is a system which is SQL Server based. That, that's where we're getting our backlog information from. We are leveraging the enterprise data warehouse that Mike helped us with to get HR and project data. So obviously that's Snowflake talking to Snowflake, so pretty automated there. And then IEX Cloud is kind of an interesting one. That's where we're getting the market data, uh, stocks, commodities. And we're pulling some of that data uh, every 15 minutes, unemployment, things like that. We just pull once a month. And we're grabbing that from a web API. So that's a pretty cool feature. I think we paid around $500 for a year's use of that. And we can get all that, that data from them. It's nice. So the architecture I mentioned earlier is pretty simple. Uh, we have Wearscape extracting data and loading it into Snowflake. Snowflake hosts all those different data sources that I just mentioned. And then we do a nightly import into Power BI. And then the wise people on the phone, which I know there's a bunch of you, will go, wait a minute, you just said stock data is every 15 minutes. 
And that is correct. So for that, we're instead of doing an import, we are hitting that with a direct query. And I'm not sure the status of that yet. So I might be, that's what we're going to do eventually if we haven't already. And then Power BI is used as the presentation layer. So with all that kind of teed up, uh, here's a few screenshots. I, I think I do five total of the final product. So some of these are, are pretty simple. Um, here's one that looks at the economy. So looking at things like copper, silver, all that, looks like any ticker you'd go see on Google Finance or MSNBC. Nothing too special here, um, but just wanted to show how we kind of got everything into one area so they can quickly come out here. You can see those trend lines, which don't really show in the, in the actual product. product. They're a little nicer. So that's one of the screens. There's a couple more that show uh, more stock quotes of our clients and competitors and has news down at the bottom. So this is the work from home slide. So I talked earlier about looking at the percentage of people logging hours from home. So that's a change we made in our time card to where you can specifically explain where you're working from, whether that be home, the field, in the office. And so you can see there, it's pretty consistent, uh, maybe dropping a little. Uh, some of those, like uh, the first week of June, the Memorial Day holiday throws that off a bit. That's why that's weird. And then the office visits by location. So going back to looking at our building access, so people badging in, here's our average. And then we overlaid that with the risk index for that location. So this, I took the screenshot a few weeks ago. I'm sure this is adjusted and wouldn't show Haley being so high and maybe Boise a little higher. But the real purpose there is for someone making decisions about office openings to be able to look at this and decide, you know, do we have a lot of people visiting the Boise office and is there, you know, kind of a hot spot there? So that's what that was for. And in fact, we going back and optimizing this yesterday, we met with our CEO and we kind of upgraded this. So we'll have a whole new one where he can actually look at the trend sorted by the location with the highest percent and change. So increase or decrease and be able to see the hot spots. So I, I believe it was Orlando yesterday was up like 400% in the last uh, seven days. So th these have certainly all changed. Whereas some of the Northeast places like Oradell, we have an office there, Hamilton, New Jersey, Boston, those are actually trending in a positive way. And then you can see our DA connections. Um, so direct access, how we access the network from home. We had a, a test from home way back in March on a Thursday. So that's the first blip. We, we all went back to the office the next day, which was Friday. And then we decided to shut things down and, and for most people and start work from home in general. So those are the four or five blips, depending on whether there's a holiday in there. The cool thing about this is you can expand it in Power BI and, and see a little bit more, but when you look at it more granular, you can notice that at the initial onset of the pandemic, people were working from home a lot on weekends and that slowly started to trend down, which is probably a good thing. So as people got used to working from home, their habits changed a little to where they could probably leave that laptop sit there without having to log in, you know, Saturday and Sunday. And then another one with, with, uh, bandwidth, looking at that. This next one's uh, grayed out a little because we don't want you to see our numbers, but I think you can still see the point of this. Um, so I talked about trend lines and each one of those is either comparing, you know, whether it be the graph to the previous year or the previous quarter, or if it's a stacked graph, then it's comparing to the previous month or previous year. So that, that's the real point there. So they can quickly visually see how each of our different KPIs are performing and make you know, adjustments accordingly. So this is back to that interesting. Um, so in the upper left, you can see that measurement is kind of dropping off pretty fast there. Well, 
that caused people a little bit of concern on some of these. And that goes back to my comment earlier about some data isn't really meant to be looked at weekly. And sometimes a month view or a quarter view makes more sense. So some of these numbers tanked for a week, but then recovered the, the very next week. So, you know, they just kind of offset each other. So that was a learning curve item for us as we started getting more frequently, our data polls more frequent. So here's a tab that doesn't really have, um, it's not visualizations or anything like that, but it's one of our cool lessons learned. And that is, um, John Williams is our report developer, and he just started throwing on the screen so we could convey information to the users of the dashboard. So it's a change log or release notes, whatever you want to call it, but we throw that right in with the report and it's been a hit. So the CEO can go out there and he can see what's changed, you know, what new functionality he should be looking for, those types of things. And that's been really popular instead of having to send an email or, you know, whatnot to convey that. They can just come out here and look and they do. Uh, the next one is we had questions about when the data was being refreshed. So if you recall all the way back to that data sources screen, we had some data as weekly, quarterly, monthly, uh, every 15 minutes. So this is just a, a tab that we threw on there so they know exactly what data is updated and when. So they can go out here and you know kind of self-help instead of having to ask us or, or expect the data to be there, but it's not. So this is another good idea that we came up with as a team, and it's been a, a hit. Dan, if I could ask a question about that, is that sure? That looks like a static kind of like an SLA report as opposed to a live, actual feed of the metadata that you loaded the night before. Is that true, or am I missing something? Yeah, this is no, this is static. Yeah, it, this and the last one are just static. Is there anything that would show if there was an error or some leading indicator of uh, you know, a data load problem or, or something out of sorts with data quality? Uh, we're just handling that manually now. Yep. Part of the progression, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, that's also good to verify people are, you know, I'm not just talking to myself too, so that's that's good. <laughs> Okay, so lessons learned. When I first started putting this together, I kind of thought of the concept of the movie, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, just because some of the things we learned were good, some were bad, but I don't know that anything was really ugly. So I kind of mixed that and came up with a different theme. So we still got Clint Eastwood in it, he's the good. And then we added Chuck Norris to our movie because, you know, Chuck Norris is awesome. So he's the really good. And then we've still got the bad. So the good lessons learned, the daily stand-up meetings that we had, so part of that agile process were very beneficial, we felt. So questions didn't linger. Everyone knew what everyone was working on because we talked, about, talked through it during those meetings every day. And usually these are half an hour, depending on whether John talks a lot. So I, I tease John a lot. He's the head developer on this, and uh, you know he, he he's doing a great job, but he he tends to talk, take over those meetings. So which is good. He should. We learned a lot about our company. So another good thing, and our data. So working with so many different data sources meant that. I was picking up the phone and calling people I've never talked to, asking them about their data, trying to understand how it worked. Um, we built relationships through this. We worked with the finance team and we solved, you know, there was kind of always silos there and we solved age old mysteries about the data. So sometimes we thought their data sucked and they thought ours, you know, and we actually solved that stuff, which will help us going forward big time. Rapid prototyping worked. So earlier I talked about even having, you know, prototypes mocked up. Um, I did a lot of that in, in paint shop. The only disclaimer I will give is sometimes 
this approach put a lot of pressure on John to match my prototype. So the prototype would just, man, I was taking screenshots off of other people's reports and pasting those in and tweaking it. So it would look a certain way, we'd get that approved, and then John had to go dip, duplicate that in Power BI. And sometimes that wasn't always possible. So that th there is a little bit of um, warning there that that could go, go badly. And then the previously mentioned what's new and data refresh screens, we thought those were a hit as well. And that's the feedback we've gotten from the executive team. They really enjoy those. All right, so the really good, um, I thought our technology stack rocked it. We were able to build all this really fast because of the tools that were in place. So a little bit of credit needs to go to uh, Mike as well for helping us get that set up. So we had our Wearscape environment, Snowflake, Power BI, all that was ready to go. And then, you know, things like Snowflake's elasticity allowed us to focus on going out and getting that data from those nine different data sources versus spinning up new infrastructure, you know, going to Keith with, to get, you know, costs approved for new, you know, infrastructure servers, storage, all those different things. So because, you know, Snowflake's in the cloud, we simply just started uploading more data and obviously we pay for that but it's incremental and you know it's not just a you know big bang cost there so that helped us move quick another really good was our executive team was fully involved so our ceo or sorry cfo came to the stand-up meetings um, and he was really the go-between with our executive team even our, our CEO was quick to respond to all of our inquiries. So he had a vision for this. And if, you know, I called and said, hey, what do you think of the work from home tab? I'd get immediate feedback. And then we moved on to the next, you know, tab or piece of information. And like it says there on that last bullet, you can't move fast without that quick feedback. It just, you know, we can do everything we want, but until we're getting things approved and the data approved, the design approved, you can't move as quickly as we did. So they were definitely a big piece of that. So user adoption was superb. We had heard rumors that our CEO was looking at the dashboard twice a day. And then with the usage reports that come out of the box with Power BI, we've actually proven that. And we can see literally, you know, all of the execs are, are in there using the tool. I wouldn't say twice a day like the CEO is, but I mean, there's applications that are, awesome that people like this will never touch so for him to be going in there a couple of times a day um, makes me feel good about all the time we we put into this that it is adding value and something that they care about i guess one other thing i i see here in my notes is on the technology stack you know I, this isn't a plug for wearscape i heard there might be someone on but Wearscape is literally built to support automation and not having to write a lot of code. So back to that first bullet point, you know, having Wearscape really helped us get things going fast as well, right? For just the whole purpose of why it exists. Okay, so I shouldn't have saved the bad for last, but here we go on some of the bad stuff. Um, we did have to build the data model on the fly. Um, so that required some optimization once the dust settled. It's still not ideal, but you know the, the reports are functioning and now we have a little bit more time to, to circle back the wagons and, and come in and, and optimize that. So some of what we already have. Um, the cool thing is we didn't paint ourselves into a corner, thankfully. Our lack of data definitions and standards as a company also slowed our progress. So like I talked about earlier, we had finance and IT silos. Um, we did kind of break through on that, but had we not had to break through and everyone's, you know, so sorry, all these data pieces were already defined, that, that would have helped us move faster. But instead we had to have meetings on top of the other meetings about, you know, what's the definition of this? Can we agree on it? You know, finance is used to seeing you know, they were literally saying our number is 2.38 and ours was 2.36. You know, what's what's the right answer there? So in the future, that 
that is definitely something we need to go back and and address. And, and we kind of have, you know, that was part of the reason of our enterprise data warehouse was to to add that at some point and we'll get there. And then I already mentioned this, but some data isn't meant to be looked at daily or weekly. We learned that. So backlog would be one example. Um, proposals come and go and, you know, one week you'll get no proposals and the next week you'll get $21 million worth of proposals. So that really throws that, you know, weekly number off, but it averages out over a month or a quarter. So we learned that. Um, did have a little bit of panic on a few occasions. Literally days off affect our utilization. Um, so we had a holiday and people would you know, be calling us, hey, how come the you know, Achieve Multiplier tank last week? It's like, <laughs> because there was a holiday and it wasn't as high. So we, we learned some of that stuff. And you know, I don't know if we'll go back and retweak some of those reports to where they are a little more broad, but um, lesson learned there. Okay, so in summary, um, in a little more than a month, we created a fully functional dashboard for our executive team, which is something I was telling Mike about, which might be why I'm here. So we were able to do it with uh, minimal costs, as mentioned on the previous slide. We feel our agile, agile methodology was key to that. And then we are really happy to be able to share with you guys. So this community has been great. Um, we've received help from Blue Cross and Simplot and several other companies. So we are ecstatic to be able to actually pitch back in and, and help you guys out if this presentation did do that. So anyway, it's a, it's a great community and Mike's been great getting us in contact with different people from you know, doing the same things, facing the same struggles as us, and, and that's been great. And it's our pleasure to con contribute back. So with that, any questions for me? Dan, this is Kathy Wright. Um, okay. So question for you on the, um, you know, bringing this forward in a month, which is really awesome. I mean, what you guys did was fabulous. Um, you already had the infrastructure in place with Snowflake and Wearscape before you started it. This, right? Yeah, and Power BI. Uh, and Power BI. We had, okay. yeah, we had two areas of focus. So we have a tool called the Project Health Dashboard. That was, I wouldn't say complete, but near completion. And then we had an HR dashboard that was near completion. And I mean near completion when this started. They have since been completed by the same team that worked on on this so okay. but you did have to add in additional data sources as part of this project right those are the additionals you mentioned yeah into, into the snowflake yeah eight of the nine were new i believe okay thank you For the definitions that you said needed to be defined and kind of caused it to slow down because you had to, you know, def uh, understand what the differences between numbers were. Were there any that were a surprise, or did everybody kind of already know the um, issues uh, where they had different definitions or for the same piece of data? I think there was definitely some surprises. So we were you know, IT, so very automated. So we're pulling our data from our ERP system and we just think that's, you know, the end all be all, right? It has to be right, that's what's in there. But then we find out that finance um, made some changes and, and different things like that that add to the data. So I think that's where some of the surprises were. Also, another issue was, um, and we've kind of known this for a while, but is around, um, lost my train of uh, thought there for a second, how we do our organizations. So there's, you know, there's an organizational hierarchy as far as reporting, but then there's a different one when it comes to finance. So we struggle with that a little too. So they're saying, you know, this group or division should be, you know, have this much profit and we're not seeing anything close to that that's when we got in some of those root issues of how do we define, define 
divisions, you know, in their silo versus our, our silo. And, th and that's something we're still working through. So those would be a couple of examples of that. So for your your definitions and the fact that you're able to establish some of that um, alignment between different areas, how are you storing that or how are you making those definitions available for future discussions? Are you using a data catalog or can you talk a little more about that? Um, I think we're going to go with the data catalog. Bonnie, do you want to take that one? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, we are, we've actually created a data catalog. Um, we've created it based off of the metadata that we've entered in through Wearscape. And so that way we can have all the definitions in one place. And then we created a Power BI dashboard on top of it so that our end users can see what that, that metadata is. Cool, thank you. So do you think it Anyone could be potentially, else? do you think it could potentially be another tab similar to those tabs you said that were the hit where it would be a metadata tab where you're able to look up those definitions and it would be right there within the Power BI, or what are your ideas there? Um, yeah, actually, that is something that I've thought about. Um, we've got it organized in such a way um, using projects and at, in Wearscape in the metadata there, where we're able to, to pick out which ones are for which data set in Power BI. And then the goal is to possibly do that so that it's self contained in the report and the data set and they don't have to go to a second location. So yeah, that's definitely on the roadmap. So what other so metadata, nice. what other yeah. metadata, can you describe that a little more too? Well, we basically just put in um, like the business names that we're using in um, Power BI. And so within Wearscape, part of that metadata is to give like a business name. And so that's the name we show the users so they can look it up by what they see in the data set. And then as part of the description um, and some examples, we're able to put in, you know, if there's a calculation for that field, we'll put in the calculation so they can go back in and figure out, you know, if this is a calculated field, what all is going into that. So it'll give them insight into, um, you know, description of what the data is with examples. And then also if it's a calculation, what that calculation is. Do you have the sources? Um, we do, we, we don't really have that out there yet because um, most of the data that we have is our ERP data. Um, so we haven't had the need, but that's the end goal is to provide the source and then um, examples and definitions on any calculated columns. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sounds like someone else was asking a question before. Maybe not. <laughs> I just had probably a bunch in a row. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That, this is good. That's how you learn, right? Damn yeah, it. this is. Go ahead. I think. Uh, okay. I think you made it. This is Mike. I think you made a key point about um, you know your data model wasn't not ideal. Um, you know, you have to start somewhere, and I think that's what we see is uh, a lot of times is organizations afraid to start because it isn't perfect. And I think what you called out is that you made use out of something that was less than perfect, and you're always improving it. Can you talk about the progression and what else you have to do, and if there was any do-overs, what you would do differently? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> There are a lot of uh, uh, different areas. I, I guess, well, Bonnie, I, you might be best to talk about some of this stuff because um, that's your life every day. Yeah, I was going to ask maybe Bonnie or John have some input. Or, in or John, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me, Dan? We can. Okay. Yeah, I just mentioned that, you know, just going on along the lines that 
Mike was talking about there. It's about incremental value. So uh, when Dan was discussing, and I'm sure Bonnie has a bunch of stuff on, on the data, but even on the reporting, the, it starts with an idea. And we put that idea out in the form of a prototype. Um, some of that stuff was pictures, as Dan showed. And then that would um, progress. And we would get uh, something a, a, a little bit more accurate. It might be um, it might be a picture that is based off of fake data to start with. And then that might be a picture that's based off of real data, but it's still a picture. And we have that pasted right into the Power BI report. And then that picture might turn into a real Power BI visualization built on real data, which would provide even more value. So we had a bunch of those that are side by side with each other. Um, some complete report pages were all prototypes um, alongside other pages that uh, were full um, Power BI visualizations. But because of this, you know, uh, with us not waiting for perfect, we're allowed to get value along the way. And I think the biggest mistake that a person can make is try to get everything perfect before they move, as you mentioned, <laughs> because you'll really miss out on that incremental value. And, and that's where um, some of these visualization tools really help out. They um, lower the development life cycle so that you can get quick turnaround and start getting value right away. Thanks for pitching in there, John. Any thoughts from Bonnie? Um, I think from a data perspective, um, you you kind of have to make sure you start with simply what you know is accurate and right because you want to you know have them come in and go, this this data isn't right because that's just gonna totally you know throw them off um but then gradually build in complexity so you start with you know the, the stuff that you know is right is accurate and you know start getting them used to the look and the feel and how a dashboard works and i think that worked out really well for us we you know started with more static data um things that they knew were right and confirmed. And then we, we kind of progressed into more um, dynamic data, adding in things that were more detailed and give them more options on what they could choose from. Um, and so it's, it's key to be quick to get it out, but you also want to make sure at the same time that the data is right, because <laughs> you don't want to accidentally you know, put something out there and have them go, well, that's not right. And then they don't believe what they see. So, you know, start with the ones that you know are true and accurate and then start gradually building in and it gives you more time to build that accuracy up so that by the time you're ready for those more detailed reports you've got the accuracy that you need to make them correct that makes sense did um you know having worked with you i'm i'm familiar with the modeling techniques you use primarily flat uh tables is how you're uh you're projecting that data. Can you contrast that with, I know there's a lot of people on the group that have practiced some data vault and a lot of people are savvy with the dimensional modeling, star schemas and that. Did, have, did you notice any particular pluses or minuses of the modeling technique you used in terms of flexibility or speed of delivery or anything? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty quick. We were able to actually take because um, as Dan mentioned, we were already in process of working on a couple of different dashboards. And so we were able to, you know, use a lot of that that we built um, as a good starting place. And, um, and so we we're able to reuse quite a bit of at least the starting part of it and then build in some extra data sets. Um, the biggest problem I had is that with this particular dashboard, it, a lot of it was not related information. So we've got a lot of stuff in there, but a lot of it's siloed, but to put it in one data set was making it really complicated um, because you might have a dates table, but that dates table would you know relate to this piece of information, but you need another date table for you know a different piece of information because the way that they're related, they couldn't be together with the same table. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but um, so having such disparate information in one data set made it really challenging, as well as data sets or pieces of information that have different refresh schedules. Um, and so 
having that in mind, we probably would have done things a little differently <laughs> um, just because of the refresh rate for some of these things. Um, but it, the ease of being able to have the flat tables and be able to you know, reuse them, it worked out really well. That's, that's great to have that feedback. I, one of the conversations that got Dan and I started down the path that eventually made work for him in preparing for this <laughs> today was a, a, a discussion that I had forwarded to him about three different industry experts debating star schema versus data vault versus flat, flat tables. And, um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm curious, I was curious to see how they work for you. I'm glad to hear and really hats off to you guys and your team for, um, for being ready for the, the virus, so to speak, you know, for having that preparation up front. Kathy alluded to it a little bit ago. Did you already have all your technology decisions in place before the virus hit? Well, yeah, there'd been some foresight there on your part that made it possible, not easy, but possible for you to put these insights in front in a in a quick fashion. And uh, my hat's off to you on that. In fact, uh, I sat on a governor's task force that a technology task force that, that was an analyzing and I use you guys without calling you out by name, but I use you guys as a kind of a shining example of somebody who was just a little bit ahead of the curve because you had made some decisions and been proactive on your data platform and, and already you know started down that path ahead of time. So hats off to you. Yeah, and really to Bonnie's point, you know, some of those things like the data, you know, not naturally, you know, merging well, those were meetings we had after the kind of like there was two projects. There was the one which was the public facing, you know, application, but then there's kind of the back end technical team. And, and so we were kind of meeting on both of those at the same time to address some of those concerns. And, you know, another thing that popped up eventually was you know, combining all of this different data, we created these huge imports from Snowflake into Power BI and we're, you know, testing limits there. We had to go back and optimize that. So, you know, it was definitely a learning process, but I feel though, had we went and figured all of that out, we would have spent six months before we ever delivered a product, you know, that, which in this case, we delivered one in a week or two that started adding, adding value immediately, so. Nothing like a crisis to light a fire. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, kind of as you've alluded to, Bonnie and John were amazing. You know, they were working 16 hour days and literally were, you know, emailing each other or IMing each other at two in the morning sometimes. So it, it was a fun project and, and they uh, stepped it up. You have a demented definition of fun, but we'll go. With that. <laughs> hey, when you're getting, you know, <laughs> feedback from your CEO that you're yeah. hitting a home run, that that's good stuff. So yeah, no, that's good. Other questions, comments? Dan, this is Kathy again. I do have to tell you when you talked about having to do definitions and like <laughs> to get the common terms. Um, I was laughing out loud and Ginger is <laughs> agreeing with me. So I have that same challenge pretty much everywhere I've gone. <gasps> yeah, it's nice to know you're not alone out there in trying to to get those definitions. And and it's it's interesting um, what it takes to get them and get agreement on them. Yeah, we've got a big project to Re, uh, bring in a new ERP system. So this actually was pretty timely for us because it, you know, that paradigm shift taught us lessons there. So we know we want to be more agile when we're implementing that, but we also know that, you know, we, we've talked and we built those relationships. So now it should be easier when we need to go solve those issues once and for all, because we know each other and we have a background of why the numbers aren't jiving between the two different groups. So. It'll be yeah. nice going forward. Yeah. Uh, follow up to Kathy's previous question about the data glossaries. And I know Bonnie mentioned that you were able to use some of your metadata to generate those. I, of course, am biased and am a firm believer and proponent of automation within the data space. Um, can you talk about 
the lessons. Um, that, that was at least one positive lesson with regard to documentation. But any other lessons, uh, good, bad, or ugly, regarding your automation experience? And you can tell the truth, even though the vendor happens to be. On the <laughs> <laughs> they, they did. They did not uh, sponsor the event, so you can say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the only thing I would really highly recommend is make sure you get your definitions done at the lowest level um, so that when you're building on top of it, it just copy it, within Wearscape. Sorry, because I know everybody uses Wearscape. Within Wearscape, you basically can put in, um, in you know, descriptions and, and business logic and or, uh, business names. Um, within the definitions at each level. And so if you start at like your load table and make sure you've got the business names right. And, you know, as you're growing, you make sure that when you build your staging table, it automatically copies that in. And, you know, if you end up doing calculations, doing it at the, the lowest level so that it gets copied up to the next like view or dimension or fact table, it saves you a ton of time having to retype things in. <laughs> um, it just, it, yeah, just make sure that when you've got your definitions, you've got them set um, early on so you don't have to go back and change all of that. I mean, it's doable. It's just having to go back and find all those places and, and rename them can be kind of a pain. Um, but it is nice having it in one place because I could just go in if I've misnamed something, you know, go fix it real quick and then run my process to export all the metadata from Wearscape and then the users can see the change right away. And so it's been pretty helpful and, you know, being able to have all the calculated information in one description so they can go in. It'd be nice to have an actual field in Wearscape where I could put that, but, um, you know, right now I can use the description and, and put it in there so that the users can see how we're building it. And, you know, as I'm building that calculation, I can put it in there um, so that I don't have to go back and update it later on. It's just in that one spot. Yeah, so. most modern data architectures have uh, some type of business rules or business logic layer. And, um, you know, we talk about pushing left, right? Pushing your logic left and not, not implementing business rules in your reports, but in some common business layer where you can get a lot of reuse out of those. And naming is just another one of those business rules, isn't it? If you do yeah, your naming yeah. far enough left in your, in your, um, uh, processing stream, then you don't have to align it and keep it consistent everywhere. It, it kind of automatically inherits from that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 The sooner you can get it in and get it accurate, you know, and build upon whatever you've already done, then, you know, if your tool is able to do that, then that's great. Then you don't have to go back and fix it all later on. Right. Thinking like in the dimensional model, it's your conformed dimensions and in data vault, it's your business vault layer, right? Yeah. Anytime yeah. you can push that into a consistent layer to the benefit. All right, we're down to five minutes. Any more uh, quick questions for the team? There at power. I saw Keith, your sponsor, CIO was on there. Um, Thanks, Keith, for joining and for loaning your team to us. I know a little bit of preparation goes into something like this. We really appreciate the insights. Yeah, no, like Dan said, we uh, this community has been really helpful to us, and so we'd like to give back a little bit. And uh, we're really proud of our efforts and wanted to share that with everybody. So uh, it's nice to to see the interest, and we're happy to share our our uh, experience. Okay, then. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, just once again, thank you to Dan and the power team for, for uh, sharing with us, putting this together. I know it takes a little time to do that. Um, please reach out to me, anyone who has ideas for a topic in August or thereafter, and we'll get you on the agenda. And I just appreciate everybody tuning in today. I, First count, we had 25 on the call. I don't know what we ended up with, but um, really good turnout today. I, 
I think we might just have to continue these online meetings because it just makes it easy for everybody to get to. Maybe if we were to end, um, maybe we could just have a quick hands vote on um, raise your hand if you think that online is uh, preferable to our past um, in-person meetings. And um, I'll assume that everybody else was either asleep or prefers to meet in person. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, you know, maybe we'll still get together in person once in a while, but I see a lot of hands going up, maybe about two thirds are still awake. So, you know, we'll just continue to have these online and then maybe do some event in the fall where we get together face to face again. How's that sound? Sounds great. That's a great idea. Perfect. And again, any feedback on, in that regard, um, is good. So will you share the recording later too? I will. I'll send out an email with that uh, Eckerson Research Report link and the link to the uh, recording. Thank you for getting that approved, Dan. I know there's always a little bit of concern um, with recording these things, so we appreciate you being willing to do that. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, everyone. Appreciate the interaction today. Good questions. Good dialogue and uh, uh, great content, Dan and team. Have a great afternoon. We'll catch thanks. You. Thanks. Bye, Thank everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Nice presentation. Thanks.